I grew up playing lots of NES, Sega Genesis, and Game Boy. But when it came to other video game consoles released throughout the 80s and 90s, I had no idea many of them even existed until the mid-2010s. I remember going to the video game rental store most weekends to pick out a game or two during the Sega Genesis era. But in all those visits, I have no recollection of seeing TurboGrafx stuff on the shelves. I never knew anyone that had the system either. Not even my best friend's family that had stuff as weird and wonderful as the Virtual Boy did. I actually learned about it around the same time as the Sega Master System back in 2016. My husband and I were going to a game swap with the intention of picking up both systems, but after looking around the convention floor for a few hours, the pricing for anything TurboGrafx was way outside of what I was willing to spend at the time. We only brought home a Master System that day, and it wasn't until a few years ago when the TG16 Mini came out that I seriously started considering getting into that system again. I imported it from the United States, and even though the box is one of the ugliest I have in my collection, since Amazon didn't put it in a second box to send to me, I'm still really glad to have it. The unit has lots of interesting titles on it, but the reason I bought it was for two in particular, Castlevania Rondo of Blood and Newtopia. Newtopia follows the adventures of Gizetta, a rather bad-headed young man who takes up the task of rescuing the kidnapped Princess Aurora, as well as retrieving eight stolen medallions. The culprit here is Dearth, an evil demon who really doesn't have all that much of a backstory other than he is, in fact, evil. The story is actually pretty sparse and generic, with just enough structure to give cause and set the stage for someone to swing a sword around all over the land in the name of restoring peace. It's entirely likely that you've experienced at least one other adventure that stars a young swordsman on a quest to save the world, and Newtopia is largely unremarkable among them. It wouldn't take anyone familiar with this game style too long to notice the wealth of similarities that Newtopia shares with its comparators. There's a life meter that extends every time you finish up a dungeon, regular armor and equipment upgrades, as well as some special items that can be used to reveal new paths in labyrinths and on the overworld. Even the enemies you duke it out with are many of the same ones you've seen in other adventures. When it comes to choosing things that set Newtopia apart as something special, unfortunately there's really not much other than a magic system I'll talk about shortly, if you can even call it that. The game is ordinary almost to a fault in many ways, but let's examine a few things about it a bit more closely. An aspect of the gameplay that I felt really held it back was how on rails it is. Just to be clear, I don't think a linear game is inherently bad. A lot of similar titles present you with vast worlds to pour over while hunting down all their secrets, and there's not one example that I've played where you're free to complete all of the game's objectives in any order you like. The difference between most games and Newtopia is that others usually impart a sense of freedom while perusing the lands. Newtopia actually brings the concept of an open overworld a huge step in the wrong direction, because the majority of the game is physically locked away until you complete the previous chapter. There's a hub area of sorts that permits movement between the game's four spheres or stages, meaning that there's no natural flow whatsoever like you'd get if it were all one interconnected, sprawling world. Structuring it this way sucked a lot of what I love about these kinds of games right out of it. To me, the best part of a quest like this is walking around and noticing something suspicious. It could be something like a tree that seems out of place, or even a curious indentation on a cliff face that I might be able to do something with down the line. You know the stuff. There are things you have a revelation moment about and rush back to after you find a new item that might solve that puzzle. Here though, there's not really much of that to be had across the whole game. The way that the spheres are compartmentalized removes a lot of that creativity and thinking from the equation, which I thought was a huge negative on the game as a whole. That's not to say that there aren't any secrets to find. There are actually quite a few of them, and nearly every screen has something to uncover if you're willing to check around for them. Pushing rocks or boulders, bombing walls, and killing all enemies on screen are a couple of ways to trigger a secret entrance, but Newtopia also has an extra method that requires the use of magic. You eventually get your hands on the fire rod, and if you're roaming around the first area and direct it towards certain trees, they'll burn away and reveal something underneath. This was pretty cool at first, but things got a little weird once I got to the next sphere. There weren't any trees here, but there were tons of these crystalline rocky projections. I didn't even think to try the fire magic on these because it didn't make logical sense that fire would burn through something like that. Since it was my first playthrough, I thought I might be getting a different kind of magic down the line that could destroy the crystals. Well, wouldn't you know it, the fire magic also melts them and will also eliminate other interactable parts of the environment in each sphere going forward, logic be damned. 
I actually discovered this by accident when I was throwing fireballs around fighting some insects. I was wrecking them when, lo and behold, the crystal melted away right before my eyes. It was a pleasant discovery, albeit a frustrating one given how much time I wasted roaming around not knowing that I could even do that to begin with. The manual was no use either, because all it says is that it gives you the magic of fire and doesn't really tell you how to use it. The combat in Utopia was enjoyable, but admittedly a little fiddly. You have a sword as a primary weapon, and eventually, after you get the fire wand, you can use that as a projectile attack. While the sword can be very effective, it felt way too difficult to connect with most enemies. This is the furthest thing from a grid-based experience where you and your foes walk on the same plane of depth at all times. Here, they can be just above or below where your swing lands, which caused me to whiff attack after attack. The range on the sword is also quite short, and because of how often I missed, I took on a lot more damage than I wanted to. Things changed for the better once I found the wand because it had a much larger range. Not only the extra throwing distance, but also the width of the projectile itself seemed to catch enemies more reliably than the sword could. The rod's actually a pretty unique addition to this kind of game that I haven't seen before. As you play through the game and extend your life bar, the powerfulness of your magic also increases. The catch is that you actually have to maintain your health above certain thresholds to use the stronger magic, and losing health brings the spell back down to a weaker form. Considering how much I was bleeding my health away simply trying to slay regular enemies on the overworld, I was stuck using the weakest form of the fire rod attack the majority of the time. It was a bit slower and slightly weaker than the sword, but way safer than the other options I had available to me. I think the only downside to the fire rod was that the game didn't do more with this mechanic. It seems like a great idea that was heavily underutilized. I wonder if they brought it back in Utopia 2 and developed it a little more there. I haven't played that one yet to know for myself, but a couple of other spell types and more versatility apart from burninating the countryside would have been amazing. On the topic of losing health, I found it incredibly difficult to avoid dying for all the reasons I just mentioned. Unlike other games, Newtopia is extremely stingy with its health drops from monster kills. They do exist, of course, but more often than not, I was rewarded with bombs or clocks that stop time temporarily. There were a few other ways to regain life, like visiting a healer or buying potions from a shop, but depending on how deep into the game you were, the latter was potentially unaffordable. Making matters worse is that when you die in Newtopia, you actually lose half your gold. And if you just got wrecked in a dungeon run and used up all of your potions trying to push through, it's entirely possible that you might revive with too little money to be able to restock potions without having to grind up first. Considering how difficult it was to hit enemies, I found this to be a really annoying aspect of the gameplay, but circumvented it by taking advantage of the TG16 Mini's save feature. Before I'd head out to a dungeon, I'd load up on potions and other items, save my game with the file cabinet system, and then let fate run its course. If I ended up slain, reloading was the much more efficient option. For anyone wondering, unless you had some extra hardware add-ons for the original TurboGrafx-16, most games couldn't be saved. In the case of Newtopia, all you could get were passwords to continue from. They're not quite as heinous as some of the ones I've seen for NES games, but I definitely appreciated that the TG16 Mini afforded me the luxury of a proper save I could go back to at any time. Figuring out how to advance this story was actually on the easy side. If I'm being completely honest, there were very few times in this playthrough where I felt like I personally earned my progress or got any satisfaction out of solving where I needed to go on my own. There are two main culprits for this, and the first is the compass in the inventory screen. Whenever you're wandering around on the overworld looking for the two shrines in each sphere, it actually points to where they are relative to your position. Talk about draining the mystery out of things. I mean, sometimes the path is obscured by obstacles or requires a special item to get there, but they may as well have put a neon sign with a huge arrow on every screen just showing you which direction to take. The second aspect is even more bothersome. Most of the characters you meet spoil exactly what should be done next or where to go. Usually, talking to people in games gives you a gentle nudge in the right direction, or hints about a mechanic you might eventually need to move on. In Utopia, the residents didn't even try to be coy in these exchanges. If I had to guess, the social norm in this world is to be as utterly direct and as honest as possible because nobody was able to hold themselves back from clearly and concisely leaking all of the land's secrets. To me, this is a worst case scenario in a video game genre that's based on exploring. There was not a single moment of peace where I was just left to my own devices to roam around and test out my own theories. 
I found this pretty maddening, since so much of the exploration was already cheapened by the sphere isolation and the compass lighting up the path to victory so brightly. Between being shamelessly bossed around by Newtopia's inhabitants and having to move through the game in a very deliberate way, after a while it felt like I was simply going through motions rather than actually playing the game myself. There's nothing wrong with clarity in a game's directives, but here, a line was crossed where the player autonomy was completely torn away. I also feel like the dungeons were disappointing. Many of them relied heavily on some of the same mechanics to open up secret paths that I mentioned earlier, the bombing walls, pushing blocks, and killing all monsters in a room. It was very rare to need to use a special item or magic to move forward, making some pretty huge labyrinths feel extremely repetitive after a short time. Every time I walked into a room full of blocks and saw the door slam shut behind me, I inwardly screamed because I knew I would need to shove every single one of them in order to find the one that would open the doors again. And the rooms don't just have a couple of blocks to try either. They're filled with them like some kind of evil Sokoban. I wish the dungeons had introduced a little more variety or been a little more puzzle-based versus needing to bomb every wall to find a new path or masquerading as a game instead of a block-pushing simulator. Even worse still was that many of the boss fights at the end of these areas didn't bring any additional challenge to the mix, save for maybe one or two, and that includes the final boss. The hardest encounter in this game was being able to hit enemies with the wiener sword, and that's pretty unfortunate. Now, there were a few massive positive takeaways here, with the first being the graphics and the music. Even if the gameplay itself was a little flat, the way they presented it was fantastic. I haven't played too many Turbo Graphics games, but the color palette popped and things had plenty of visual interest, especially some of the enemy sprites and bosses. The soundtrack was also a complete knockout with one exception, the dungeon music. As if the dungeons weren't already frustrating enough, they put the same song in every single one of them and it has a very short loop. That music just made me feel kinda sad instead of instilling curiosity in me like most dungeon themes do. The overworld tunes in each of the spheres were amazing though, and I was bopping along to every other song from start to finish. The second part of Newtopia that I adored was the fact that your character sprite changes its appearance as you find new equipment. It was a small win, but one that I really like seeing in these kinds of games. Nothing could get Gisetta's hair under control though. I kinda wish he'd gotten a helmet at some point just to cover up his wily locks. Well, it might not come as a surprise that I didn't love my time with Newtopia. For all the excitement I had leading up to that playthrough and it being one of the choice games I'd had my eye on for purchasing the TG16 Mini in the first place, it was a bit of a letdown. It's not a bad game, but it felt like a very neutral experience for me. It didn't do anything exceptionally different, it didn't really challenge me in any meaningful way, but it did do a lot to capture interest in other ways like its quirky world and its beautiful presentation. I think this would have been an absolutely fantastic game to break into the genre with as a kid, especially back in 1990. It has everything a fun action-adventure game should, with some RPG elements as icing on the proverbial cake, but its linear nature and in-your-face directives would be perfect for someone trying to navigate this kind of experience for the first time. As someone like me, having started out with The Legend of Zelda and enjoying more challenging games like Golden Axe Warrior or even Crystallis, coming to Newtopia almost felt like a regression. If they lightened up on the hand-holding and left even a little something to the imagination, I definitely would have gotten more out of this one. As it stands though, it was just okay to me, and I don't think it's one that I'll be picking up again anytime soon, though I am looking forward to playing the sequel sometime.